in the since we first started doing the health hour is that a lot of our questions that follow um, our sessions are really to do about our faith and how our faith intersects with our scientific background. There are usually lots and lots of questions about whether prayer um, can help with that condition, um, whether we should be taking some of the medications that we take and whether our faith is enough to get us through. So I'm really, really pleased this morning to invite um, Dr. Aya Alatoye, who is going to speak to us about faith and medicine really. And also we have a panel discussion afterwards because all our, uh, you're all quite interactive and our discussions usually involve lots and lots of questions. So what we've done today is that we have a panel discussion after Dr. Latier has done his presentation, which will involve a pastor who is also a doctor, Dr. Joe Mofua, and many of you would have heard Dr. Joe speak before. In fact, Dr. Joe spoke um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was it last week? Um, he's spoken recently, but we also have a, one of our consultants who's a Muslim, who will also answer questions from that perspective. And we also have an imam. So that should make for quite a good and rich discussion. Please be prepared to contribute and pop your questions in the chat if you have any questions. Um, and there it is. So good morning, Ayo, and over to you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you, we can see you. Fantastic. Okay, so thank you for tuning in, everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen and then we can get uh, going. Where are we? Okay. Do, do, do. I hope you're all well. It's a wonderful day for ducks. Uh, day for ducks. <laughs> can you guys see my screen? I can see your screen. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, faith and health. I, 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 disclaimer, all the pictures on this, I haven't created them. I've just found, <laughs> found them online before someone tries to sue me. Okay. <laughs> so, I... I've been tasked to talk to you guys about faith and health. Um, I always try and start my presentations with saying thank you. So um, what, do I, what am I thankful for? I want to thank Dr. Diosagi for um, reaching out and asking me to present. I want to thank um, Khan for the um, privilege it is to speak to you guys. Uh, I want to thank everybody who is logged on now and if this video is made available to anybody just for taking the time out of your day to listen you know and I'm um, I'm really proud and thankful for everybody for investing in their future because these things these things really matter um, I um, let me tell you a story so I might need to borrow you Dr. Ediosa if, if that's okay because I need some interaction for this bit so I want you to imagine the person that you love most in your mind, the person that you love most, um, you are physically distant from that person probably about half an hour drive. Um, and that person calls you and says, um, I am, I've, I've just been in a car crash. I, I'm, I'm about to go into surgery. You know, I really need you to come. I really need you to come and be here. So that's, they've called you, you're physically distant, you're about half an hour car journey. What are you gonna do? Pray. Pray, okay. What else are you gonna do? I will try and get there as quickly as possible. So how are you gonna get there? I'll drive. You'll drive, okay. So you'll get in your car. Yes. So you'll, you'll get in your Bentley and then you'll, uh, you, <laughs> you'll go. okay, so. <laughs> But so for whatever reason, you know, the Bentley's not working. It's not been taken to the service. So ha, what are you going to do next? I call a friend. You call a friend. Okay. Um, okay. So they have, you know, maybe they have a Jaguar or whatever. So you, you call a friend. Um, your friend is at a party at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It's ridiculous. Um, your friend is at a party and they can't answer. So um, what are you going to do now? Uber. That's it. Okay. Okay, Uber, fine, no problem. For some reason, there's no signal and your battery's dead. 
just after the phone call for those who were giving me continuity. <laughs> I, start, I start walking or running. I'm a good runner. So you start walking or running. I start walking or running. Fantastic, fantastic. So um, it is a ridicul ridiculous example, but the whole point of it was to get you to the point of saying, well, you would just start moving. You would just start walking in a direction because it is so important for you to get where you need to go, right? Now, one of the points I'm gonna make later is, this is why it's, it's important to have goals because getting to your loved one about to go into surgery is so important that things that on another day might have been enough to derail you, have been enough to be a significant problem on this day are a mere distraction. So on another day, the fact that your car isn't working could be the thing that the whole day is about, oh, my car's not working, oh God. Then you try and get somewhere else and I can't get an Uber. That could be the thing that your whole day is about. But because of the fact that the goal in this scenario is so important, the fact that your car, you don't even spend time pontificating about the fact that your car's not working because you have to get there. Does that make sense? So my question to you before I start is where are you going? We're talking about faith. We're talking about health. Often it is my experience that we don't um, define the goal. But if you have defined the goal with regards to your health and your faith, there are going to be ups and downs in life. There are going to be um, obstructions. But these will be mere distractions because the importance of the goal is so significant. Fine. Okay. So disclaimer, I, I don't have many answers for you. <laughs> what I plan to do is talk to you about my experience. So I am um, 40. I, um, I don't know whether you guys realize, but I am I'm black. Um, I am a consultant acute physician. So what, is, what does that mean? That means that if you need to come to hospital and the problem you have is a medical problem. So what I mean by medical, is it's not surgical, it's not ch children, it's not women stuff. It's you're, you're likely to see me. So once A&E or your GP realizes that you need an assessment or an admission, you may see me in your first one to three days. And if I can solve the problem, I'll try and solve it and try and discharge you. If I can't solve the problem or I feel that somebody more appropriate needs to solve the problem and I might refer you on. That's what a consultant acute physician does. I am a Christian. Um, I um, come from a Christian home. My parents were pastors, pa uh, pastors, excuse me. Um, my, um, I became a Christian. So when I was five, I think, was that five or seven? I can't remember. It was, it was a long time ago. That's the first time that I gave my life to Christ. I remember we were in our house. We used to live in Hume. I, um, for some reason, I was in a box, kids, uh, and I had a, what seemed like a vision, for those of you who are old enough to remember King Rolo, there was a, um, a sky like King Rolo, and there was a cloud that went across the sky, and the thought came to me, why don't you give your life to Christ, and I did, that's when I first gave my life to Christ. Um, there have been ups and downs in my journey. I remember at 17, um, so bear in mind my parents are pastors, I was, I was playing drums at another church because I was told to. And uh, um, I, th th there was a ministration um, and I felt really strongly that God was telling me that he loved me. Uh, and I, I cried, um, I cried a lot, I, I, I really wept. Um, with the realization of that. And obviously, you know, I am uh, I'm now a, a husband and a father. Those are some of the aspects of me. And I think we'll talk later about why those kinds of things are important. Um, 
So I'm a consultant, acute physician. I am young. You know, 40 is the new 50, whoever. <laughs> 40 is the new 30, they say. Um, I am black, I'm a Christian, I'm a doctor. Those monikers will become more important as we move forward. So, um, I, on the 5th of June, 2020, I was on a ward round. I didn't feel very well. I, um, I, I remember having to sit down and I, I had some, just some discomfort on my left side, nothing very mild with some pins and needles. And I thought, well, okay, I don't tend to have breakfast. I you know, do intermittent fasting. And so I, I, um, I was like, okay, so let, maybe I didn't eat last night. I haven't had breakfast. Let me just have something to eat. I asked the nurse to check my blood sugar. I don't, I don't often do that <clears throat> since I'm not particularly um, interested in my own health and digging. I wasn't particularly interested in digging into it. So my blood sugar was fine. I think it was like five or something. I had a biscuit, didn't feel better. I continued to do the ward round because that's what we're supposed to do. Continue to work, push through it, aren't we? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Um, and I, um, but I, I, I mean, I always sit down in between patients because I think you make very bad decisions when you haven't to stand up for a long time. And I, by the end of the ward run, I was limping. Uh, now I've had migraines in the past, and I thought, well, you know, there's a kind of migraine you can get which gives you funny symptoms, you know, stroke-like symptoms, if you will. And I thought, well, I'm just having a hemiplegic migraine. That's what these things are called. So I'm just having a migraine, it's fine. Just, just, just push through it, because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and I finished the ward round, did my admin. I was on a half day. I decided to drive home. Um, I remember, again, I don't often do this. I asked one of the nurses to check my blood pressure. It was high. I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm just, you know, just excited about all these symptoms that I'm having. So um, I drove home. I got home. I told my wife I wasn't feeling well. I had a nap because I'm very good at sleeping. Um, to my wife's chagrin, it's you know, it's a gift. Uh, I had a nap. Woke up. I didn't feel better. Uh, a friend of mine um, invited me to a a wealth or online wealth creation seminar. So I attended that via Zoom, um, went back to sleep again, woke up, I didn't feel better. By this time I had really heavy pins and needles on my left side from my feet to my neck and encroaching on my face. And I, I, I was limping quite heavily. Uh, I had a really, really bad headache. And I said, we have a blood pressure monitor at home. My blood pressure was very high, so high that I'm not gonna tell you because it will scare you. Um, and I, at this, the thought came to me that I've done everything I can not to go and get checked out. I should probably go and get checked out. This is about like 11 ish, 11 30. I, so we called my mum to come and stay with the kids. My wife took me to A&E and it was during the COVID time, obviously. So my wife couldn't come with me into a &E, which, you know, was quite a struggle for her. I, I limped into the a &E department. I had significant symptoms. So for those who uh, are aware, I had what you call prodronal drift. So my, my arm was doing that. And it wasn't by choice. It was, I, I wasn't, I didn't have the strength in my left arm to keep it up. And so the a &E, by the time I, I saw that, I was starting to think, oh, I started to think thoughts, as you say. Um, and the a &E doctor was like, mm, I think we need to send you to the stroke. Um, the stroke uh, hospital, because there's, a, there's, a, there's another hospital that we deal with acute strokes. We had a scan of my head, a CT scan, it was, it was fine, but like you still have symptoms, you should, you should go. This, so now we're like around two o'clock in the morning. I went to, it was Hope Hospital um, or Salford. Royal now, as it's called, and I had a, an, uh, I was reviewed by the the stroke registrar. He said, you know, it could be a migraine, but you know, you might have had a stroke. Um, let's get an MRI scan. An MRI scan is a more detailed scan of the brain. 
And I saw the consultant. She was like, yeah, he probably had a stroke. <laughs> um, and all while these things are happening, because obviously in the story, those who are in the know, very quickly you hear the story, you probably think he's had a stroke. But it didn't really hit home to me. Um, but I remember just feeling really tired, really, really tired. I, um, it was around, I don't know, three or four o'clock. I had the MR. I had to, they had to wake me up to have the MR. And um, about six o'clock when someone came to give me the results. So between four and five, this is how my brain put it together. So you've had weakness on one side with some pins and needles. Do you know when you, when you hit your funny bone and it's pins and needles, but it's almost like squeezing, it was like that all around my left side. You've had weakness on one side. You've got pins and needles on one side. You are very tired. I've worked on a stroke unit and lethargy is one of the big um, symptoms that people have after a stroke. And your blood pressure is high. High blood pressure often follows a stroke. Um, so I came to the realization, that I think you've had a stroke. Uh, and then the uh, evening registrar came to me and she said, uh, I'm really sorry, Dr. Latte. I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. I felt very bad for her because she was very apologetic as if she'd done something to me. Uh, I was like, no, no, it's fine. And I felt bad for her because she was a registrar and it, you know, made her tell the consultant that he had a stroke. By God's grace, my deficit wasn't significant. I was able to walk and do everything I needed to do. So I was able to be discharged that day and have physio and such things in, in, in the community. I had to take time off work and obviously um, just convalesce and recover. Um, it's interesting, the journey that I've been on, because obviously it made me start to think a lot of things. And the first thing I started to think was, well, okay, so I've had a stroke, I'm, I'm 40. Um, in fact, I, I was I was thirty nine at the time. To, to, to be <laughs> to be fair, you know, I'm I'm young. I I started to think about my health now. Even though I have a family history of high blood pressure and stroke, I didn't I didn't think about it. I didn't take it seriously. I I, I couldn't tell you the time before having a stroke that I checked my blood pressure in the last probably five or 10 years. I couldn't tell you. And it's not because I'm, I'm callous. It just, it just never, it never really came to the forefront of my mind. Um, so I started to, um, I started to think about um, these issues. Now, 2020 was a year that a lot of things happened. So just before the stroke, George Floyd was murdered and we all watched it on TV or on you know, social media. I had a stroke and then um, sadly my dad passed away later in the year. And there were certain things that I started to think about. So one of them was faith and health because I noticed that although I was quite happy as a doctor, I'm familiar with these things, to have these conversations with people and say, well, I've had a stroke. Have you checked your blood pressure? People came to me and started saying, well, I've had a stroke too. Um, or I've had blood, high blood pressure as well. And I, and I wondered, why, why are you whispering? <laughs> What's, what is the thing that, is, it, is, is, is there a shame associated with it? It made me question that I didn't have anything to be ashamed of. So I started to post some stuff on YouTube and start having some conversations because I think that our community, we're not big on um, having these kinds of conversations. We are, um, and I'm gonna come on to that slight, um, slightly later. Um, so I started having these conversations. Um, so I started thinking about faith, started thinking about health. I started thinking about legacy. As a Christian, one of the things that I noticed in terms of where the charismatic church is today is that we are very big on 
the wonderful acts of God and what God can do in the context of um, healing. So we there's a big conversation about healing. I think it was necessary because in the, you know, in the 80s, there's your people like Catherine Kuhlman and your Benny Hinds and your right hand bunkies, and it was a it was a big issue. I believe that we needed to understand as people the fact that God can heal, because maybe we didn't have the faith to believe it. But I think what happened is that this is a societal issue, not a faith issue, that because of the fact that there was such a big on big emphasis on the fact that God can heal. Specifically in the church, there wasn't a big conversation about health. So we were big on the intervention, the something catastrophic has happened, something miraculous is happening, and as a consequence of that, we can reverse it. But we were not big on, so what are the small things that I can do every day that help me walk in health? Even the phrase divine health kinds of almost takes the responsibility off me and gives it to God as if it is God's responsibility to make choices that I am supposed to make. God gave us free will. So in lots of different issues, remember I talked about faith, health, legacy. Um, if we take a completely separate issue, those of us who are thinking about what we're going to leave our children and and means and, and wealth and stuff like that. We even talked about how the Bible says, you know, God's gonna, we, we believe in and God's gonna give me wealth. And the Bible didn't say any of that. But God says it's gonna give you the ability to make wealth. But some of us are spending lots of time saying, I receive, I receive, I receive, and we're not doing anything. God said he's gonna bless the work of our hands. But if we're not doing anything, what is there for God to bless? A million times zero is still zero. So back to health. I found it interesting that there was a uh, lot of conversation about healing, 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 healing. And, and don't get me wrong. I believe that God can heal. I want to get that out of the way. I believe that. I, believe, I fully believe in the miraculous intervention of God for healing. I believe that. I believe where, whenever healing comes, it's from God, whether it's by miracles or whether it's interaction with your doctor. I believe the knowledge that God has given doctors has come from God. I'm, I am happy with that. But I, I believe that from a societal point of view, we have, even in the church, we have not had a great conversation about... so. For instance, the the, the 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 verse that says we are the temple of the holy, of the Holy Spirit, we're we're used to hearing that. And growing up, for me, that was a big thing. In terms, of, okay, so don't smoke, you know, and 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 sexual sin, that was a big thing. You know, make sure you know because we're the temple of the, of the Holy Ghost. But we didn't necessarily think about well, what does that mean in the context of maintenance? If you have a building, if you don't maintain it, that building is is going to go into disrepair. So what is my responsibility as a human being and as a Christian to maintain this physical body that God has given me? I know that I can go to God and if I'm in trouble, ask God for healing. But I think it's also important to remember that I believe God's best is that he's given us information and the wherewithal to be able to make small choices every day consistently that are going to lead to health. We're almost, we'd rather have the big intervention, even though it might be uncomfortable, than do something regularly every day. I hope you guys are following me. Um, fine. So, what is faith? So, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, remember when we talked about at the very beginning about your goals? If there isn't anything that you are hoping for, if there isn't anything that you are walking towards, there's nothing for your faith 
to be the substance of, which is why you have to have a goal. Oh, that makes sense. What is health? And this is a WHO um, definition, a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's the World Health Organization definition. It, I think it's very interesting because again, as a doctor that deals with people's bodies, even those of us in the hospital, we're realizing that actually there is so much information about dealing with the whole person that we need to tap into because fine, okay, you might have high blood pressure and I give you medication, your blood pressure is better, but we never really addressed well, why is your blood pressure high? We might not have had the conversation to say, well, is there something that is happening in your life that might be driving that up? Are there, you know, things that you're doing or not doing that's contributing to that? Fine, I can give you medication and that's the thing that's going to help you do the blood pressure. But prevention is better than cure. Wouldn't it be better maybe to have a longer conversation about, OK, so what are you eating? You know, how much exercise are you doing? You know, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you drinking water? How is your relationship with your family? All these things can contribute specifically to, the, to, to a blood pressure issue. And if we were to spend the time to address that, you know, maybe I wouldn't need to give you medication. The medication works, there's evidence to say that, but, you know. And let's be honest, conventional, traditional Western NHS healthcare isn't set up for this to be the way that we intervene. Um, there's a big push towards what we call lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine really is looking at the whole person and saying, well, you know, how can I, how can I move this person forward? So I'm aware of time, I'm gonna keep going. So yeah, so why are they whispering? We've talked about that already. Um, I think shame is a big issue. Um, I started thinking thoughts. So health versus healing, faith versus culture. I, I this is my opinion. No, I believe that the, the, the Bible is God's word. I believe that God's inspired word. I believe that in the Bible, there are so much information about so many things. I also believe that we gravitate to the parts of the Bible that fit our personality. Um, and sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is this the totality of the word of God? So for instance, so I'm Nigerian talking to a Nigerian about or specific about death and and um, health issues and stuff like that is a difficult thing to do and you know one of the responses you might get is okay so let's talk about death or let's talk about health let's talk about it and I'm, I'm talking about in the context of prevention did you know that as a black person there are certain things statistically that you are more at risk of now, risk doesn't equate something that's actually going to happen. But it means that we have to be informed. We have to be wise. Now, the answer sometimes is, God forbid. God forbid. Now, we can, we can do that till the cow's going to come home. But the thing I would challenge is that that is not a faith response that is a cultural response um, and we have to ask ourselves in terms of our identity who am i at my core am i so for me i would say that i am a christian first and everything else second so if there is something that I have a leaning to from a culture point of view and I have a choice that is against what my faith suggests, I have a choice to make. I think if I have time, I'm going to talk about this a bit more. I think there's an issue with regard to shame. Now, there is certain things like I've had a few conversations with a few people and you know, maybe historically, traditionally, I don't want to let you know I have a problem in terms of physical ailment because that might give advantage to my enemy. That might be historically where it came from. But, you know, 
are we there now? Is, is there an avoidance to these sorts of issues? You know, we don't want to talk about them, God forbid. We can do all that, but you are going to get older. And your body is a, you know, it's, it's a zero-sum game. What you put in, the things that you eat today are going to be what your body is composed of tomorrow. Um, I've put maturity there because it's, it's a big issue. So especially in the charismatic church, there's a lot of conversations about healing, 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 healing. But God doesn't heal everybody. Even Jesus, if you look at the Bible, he didn't heal everybody. When he went to the pool of Siloam, he went through a congregation of people, all of them who were sick. He healed one person and then he left. And that's, I think, for me, these are just part of the conversations I think we need to start having to get to mature. I don't believe it is a mature faith that says, come to Christ. <clears throat> all your problems are going to be away. You'll be healed of everything. You'll be rich. You'll be a millionaire and you have no problems. I don't believe that's a mature Faith. I don't believe that is, I don't, I think it's false advertising to be honest with you. I think maturity comes and says, okay, God is king and um, he has a kingdom. Me giving my life to him puts me in his kingdom. It gives me the wherewithal to deal with life. But I'm going to have to deal with life. I am going to have to deal with the ups and the downs. I'm going to have to deal with health issues, socioeconomic issues, family issues. My faith doesn't uh, um, exclude me from those issues. My faith gives me the strength to deal with those issues. And sometimes this Father Christmas idea of God, I pray, I get the answer that I want. I believe it's not a mature way of looking at life. Sometimes God doesn't answer in the way that I would like him to answer. I would have never prayed for a stroke. But, you know, in some ways, I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me, the way that I'm thinking now. Um, so what do I want you to do as a consequence of this? I'll be, I'll be done in about five minutes. I want you to conf confront yourself. This is what I had to do. So I, you know, Nigerian guy, <clears throat> if I've not eaten meat, I've not eaten what, what, what are you talking about? Like for breakfast, <laughs> uh, lunch, and dinner, if I can have meat with every meal, I, you know, what's, what, is, what else is there to discuss? You know, if, if, if I have salad, like salad is, is punishment, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> vegetables is it's not a real meal. And I had to confront myself because the evidence is there. I'm not going to be too prescriptive. All I'm going to say is that you, we're, we're all intelligent. We're intelligent enough to click and we'll talk about this. The evidence is there. Being in a situation where we're having meat all the time is not a good thing for your body. So confront yourself. Are you doing something that might be contributing to your real health? Ask yourself, why do you believe the things that you believe? I think it, it is my on my journey, what I have realized is that God isn't uptight. If you look at the Bible, God isn't uptight about us asking questions because questions is how you get answers not being in a situation where you know what you believe puts you in a position of, of, of risk and being able to be stale the wrong way. <clears throat> Adam and Eve, maybe if Eve knew more about what God said, she would have noticed that the devil swindled her. God didn't say you can't touch the fruit. But did, um, Eve said that um, and as a consequence of that, was able to be led astray. Now, I want to be clear, I'm with the Bible. This was all Adam's fault. I'm not woman bashing at all. This was all Adam's fault. If Adam was doing what he was supposed to be doing, you know, where, where might we be? I've got some resources. Um, right, I'm just gonna go through some, some data. I was young, but actually, young people have strokes. You know? Um, one in every four. I'm gonna. I'll send this, you know, um, talk so you can have a look at the data. But I'm, I just want to make the point: young people have strokes. I've left the the black uh, one um, blank because the majority of us on this call were black. We are dealing with 
the, the, the things that are important is that there are certain conditions that as a black person, you are more at risk of suffering from. Not only that, but as a community of black people, we are not good at what we call health seeking behavior. For instance, in a situation of an emergency, um, black and brown people tend to call an ambulance just slightly later than our white colleagues. These are, these are things that we have to address. Uh, and not only that, the George Floyd situation lets us know that when we interact with healthcare, if you look at every single outcome, for every single outcome, black people fare worse. So not only are we not doing the things that we need to do, when we interact with healthcare, we're not getting the outcomes. And we can spend lots of time and whining and complaining about that. That's not what I'm here to do. What I'm here to, what I'm here to do is say, what is in your hand to do? That's what they are doing. What are you doing? What I'm doing is having these kinds of conversations, raising awareness about it, asking you whether you've checked your blood pressure, asking you what you are eating, asking you whether you've done any exercise today, whether you're drinking water. Now, sometimes when it comes to change and stuff like that, it can seem like a big, like, how do I get to where I'm supposed to get to? Oh, it's such a mystery. Now, again, I'm not shaming anybody, but I want to, there are two pictures on your screen. On the left, let's call this gentleman Dave in the yellow t-shirt, and we'll call the gentleman on the right, Ayo. <coughs> so, <laughs> uh, we've got Dave and Ayo. Now, most of us aren't in either of these extreme situations. But I would suppose to you that um, if you wanted to move in either direction, it wouldn't be a mystery about how to take your first step. It's not a mystery how Dave looks like he does. And it's not a mystery how Ayo looks like he does. It has been my experience that, you know, God often meets us halfway, but the first movement has to be ours. So remember the goal, most of us aren't trying to be a male model or a female model, you know, but if you're trying to be healthier, what, often God meets us when we make the first movement. So what does God say? Draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. Look at all the examples of the healings. Stretch out your hand. It was in the stretching of the hand that the shriveled arm became healed. So my challenge to you is, regardless of the fact that you're not trying to be IO in a situation, I imagine you'll want to be healthy. That's why you're here. Change one thing. Is there one thing that you can do that is different to what you're doing right now. So what am I doing? I'm drinking water, one and a half liters a day in three 500 ml bottles. I am having meat-free days, which you would have never caught me doing before. I'm walking, I'm checking my blood pressure regularly, I'm taking medications, I am in therapy. All these things I'm doing, to take care of myself. Um, take home messages, take responsibility. Uh, when I say no one is coming to save us, what I mean is that the situation about George Floyd highlights to us that often our interactions with bodies sometimes doesn't go our way. So we have to take responsibility for ourselves. So I have to take responsibility for myself, but I'm also trying to help take responsibility and raise awareness in my community. That's why I'm having this conversation with you. You know, where are you going? So faith, take responsibility. What does the Bible say? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This, we, there is, God doesn't have grandchildren. So it doesn't matter what your family believes if you don't also engage and speak to God for yourself. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. None of that is going to be able to be part of your evidence when it comes to the last day when we have to have a conversation with God. What are you doing in your terms of your health? What are you doing? Are you, are you making a decision? Are you walking in a sense 
direction. And if you realize you've been walking in the wrong way, all you've got to do is decide and turn around. Eventually, you'll get into a position where it's a blessed position. You are a three-part being. Are you taking care of all of you? One of the things I've come to the realization of is that um, we're a three-part being and we need to take care of all of ourselves. But identity is a big issue. So quite often, so again, my identity before the stroke, I was a, I was a meat eater. I was a carnivore. My identity now is that I'm, I'm a healthy person making healthy choices. If I had not allowed my, my identity to change, I wouldn't have had the ability to make consistent change. Now I want to leave with you Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. Um, what God's task was to Adam was to work. I don't mean job, that's a bigger conversation, but to work. The, work, the word work when translated means to become. That was God's task. That was God's original task for all of us. So what are you becoming? That's what God wants from you, to become the person that he has in his mind. So God's task for me is um, to be healthy, to be plugged into him. He is my source. To be useful in my community. Um, and I am becoming that person, but I'm being intentional about it. So uh, I started having conversations. If you want, you know, you can follow me on YouTube. You can follow me on IG. We can continue to have these conversations. Um, that's, I mean, that's it from my presentation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was really, really, really inspiring. Um, and thank you for telling us your story. Um, we've been on this journey now, having these sessions for almost a year, just over a year. And they were set up so that people can empower themselves and take responsibility for their own health. And so having your session and your talk today that brings that to the fore is, um, is really helpful. So one of the things I'd like to ask is, uh, start off by asking is very often, as you said, you've talked about having cultural um, and faith uh, interspersed with um, beliefs. So very often we'll hear people say things like, you haven't prayed enough. And maybe that's why you're in the position that you are. Even if you're praying, you haven't done it enough because if you had, then bad things wouldn't happen. Okay, are we going straight there? Right, okay, <laughs> no problem. So, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a very difficult one. I mean, so my, my opinion on it is, is that, um, so again, let me just clarify the things that I believe. I believe that God heals. I believe that God answers prayer. I believe that God listens. I believe that the Bible says, ask, seek, knock. And when you look at the translation of these things, there's ask and keep asking. Pray, um, seek and keep seeking. There is, there is a certain type of prayer where um, a certain aspect of my prayer life that is that requires persistence. Um, and if you take a step back and look at anything in life, most things that require um, achievement in any way require you to do something more than one time. However, I think that I, I do wonder what the motivation for the person to say that in, in the context of the fact that so as, as a community, sometimes what we like to do is blame and I think that that's that's a that's a big thing. It really depends on the motivation of the person asking. Because so, even if you look at the man born blind in the Bible, so his because culturally their appreciation with the fact that for somebody to be born blind, um, well, obviously something bad has to have been done. Past tense for this person for this to be the consequence of that. Uh, but again, that was a cultural thing. Now, when you look at what this, so, so the disciples said to Jesus, so, so who sinned? 
was it this guy or was his, his parents read to me bottom line? And Jesus was like, what are you guys talking about? Like that wasn't, that wasn't even anywhere in Jesus' mind. What he said was, um, this man is born blind for um, the sake of God's glory to be shown. So what I'm saying- I, to... I, You froze for a bit. Oh, sorry. What did you hear? Sorry, you froze for a bit. Okay, so I was saying that when, when they asked him who's, who, who's, um, who sinned, Jesus was like, what are you guys talking about? That's, that, that's got nothing to do with this. This guy is in the situation that he is so that God's so, I, so God's glory can be shown. So, and again, this, to me, this is this goes back to the back to the maturity issue. So I don't believe that God's best is for us to be looking around, identifying problems in people's lives, and for me to be saying to you, the reason that you are there is because you did something wrong, you sinned, you haven't prayed enough. However, I believe that in every situation, what I am supposed to do is go to God and make my petition known to God that's clear in the Bible and have the maturity to accept the answer. Whilst, because of the fact that I believe God loves me, if, if unless I have heard explicitly from God, actually, this is something that I am not going to do, to continue to do. So there are people I know who have received a healing because of weeks of prayer, months of prayer, years of prayer. But I don't believe it's anybody's responsibility to shame them and say, well, you've not got it because you've not got enough faith. I think that's, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I actually feel, Ayo, that it's not a, a blame, but sometimes this is their genuine belief. That's the belief they're coming to. I don't actually feel that um, often it's to shame or blame. But today, we're also joined today, and thank you so much for coming, uh, Dr. Joe, who's also a pastor. And um, Olashani, thank you so much for joining us, because I think it's really important to have all aspects of faith. Yeah, and absolutely. Our faith has actually been called a lot into question this year because of the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we know there's an interplay there. And when Joe joined us a few weeks ago, he, he told a story of somebody he prescribed some anti-hypertensives to, and they were not very keen on taking them until they checked it out with their pastor. So as pastors, Joe knows he has a real responsibility and as religious leaders, because that is how people feel. Yeah. Um, that, so, and that's why we were, and, and as medics as well, we've got the scientific background and we've also got our religious faith and how that interplays with each other as well. Mm -hmm. so, so Joe, what we've heard today, one of the aspects of these talks is that everybody goes home with, with something, something that they're going to change. And you've given us a, a really powerful direction to that. But Joe, for people who are listening today, who you're about to prescribe antihypertensives, but they're not going to start them because they want to go make sure that it's okay with their pastor. What, what do you have to say about that? Thank you, Ngozi, and um, Ayo, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Um, I was actually friends with your dad. He was a really senior, big friend to, to me. I've been to the house a few times. Um, one of the aspects of your presentation that I really liked was about the fact that you taking responsibility for the incident that happened to you. I mean, um, I mean, it's a great presentation. My, one of my very close childhood friends a few years ago at the age of 41 had a stroke as well. Um, they happened to be missionaries. They were living in Canada, went to Nigeria, had a stroke in Nigeria, and I was one of the people they wrong. And I said to him, um, take yourself as soon as possible to the nearest emergency department or the next flight to Canada. I'm saying all this to, to answer your question, Ngozi. I had another church member, interestingly, she... <laughs> I will probably laugh at this, uh, probably you too, Ngozi. Um, she had facial drooping, slurred speech. She couldn't move her arm and she was ringing me for prayer. And I said, if you don't call the ambulance, I'm going to call the ambulance because you've got all the symptoms of a classical stroke. And indeed, she had a stroke. She was only 59 and she was stroking 
to the glory of God, today she's, I mean, she's walking, she's, she's much recovered. So the point I'm making is that if, when people, and I, I get this scenario a lot, uh, a lot. So when people come to me with, th this is why I love Aya's presentation, that we need to be pragmatic about how we operate our Christian faith. What, what you said in terms of the mentality being uh, childish, I actually think that's erroneous. It's false advertising. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says you should not take medication or you should not go to the doctors. There's absolutely nowhere in the Bible. One of Jesus' disciples, Luke, was a physician. So if you want to be pedantic about it, and even in the Quran, I have friends. I mean, the imam is here. He'll probably clarify. There's nowhere in any of the holy writs where it says that people should not take medicine. I do not know it of any. So it baffles me how Christians often interpret scriptures to suit our own. I believe in divine healing. I believe that people can be prayed for and people can get better. But like, like you also quite very rightly highlighted, this physical body needs to be looked after. If you don't tend your garden, weeds will grow in it. And that's, it's, I'm sorry to use computer language, but it's like garbage in, garbage out. If you sit down and, you know, and apart from even what you ingest, there are certain people, my friend, for example, he had an inherited form of high cholesterol. And that's why he had a stroke at the age of 41. He had known about it. His, his physician, family physician in Canada had told him that, look, you've got high cholesterol. You need to do something about it. But he was a pastor. He was busy. He, he passed out over five churches. He was traveling around the world. He didn't really have time to actually go and get it done. Eventually, he gets a stroke. And he's still limping today from that stroke. So... To, to answer your question, because I know other panelists are there, I can see uh, my good friend, Dr. Mo Kamara there as well. Um, uh, to answer your question, I think it's important for us to recognize that there is no clash between medicine and spirituality. Uh, the way I like to put it is that we are all in the business of healing. Whether you ingest a tablet or we pray for you, we're both getting you healed. But if, however, you have conditions, like maybe you've uh, you have an inherited condition or you're overweight or please do take medication. I'll stop there so that other people can speak. Thank you, Jill. Lashley, I would I'd like to see the, the, um, know your, some words about the, the Muslim perspective of this as well. About faith <laughs> and medicines. Okay. Uh, good morning to everybody uh, on the screen. And a special thanks to the Khan, especially Dr. Ngozi and the Charles that has tried to be establishing this type of uh, talk so that people can benefit from it. So that's a great job anyway. And uh, my special thanks to Dr. Olatoye that has presented a very good uh, presentation. And uh, to be sincere, as you said, you've really shared what you need to share with people. Not everybody can do this. So when it's come to illness, people used to hide a lot of things. They don't want to talk about it. So that maybe people won't talk, uh, their enemy, as you call it. They won't use it as a point against them. But uh, on the religious base of Islam, the prophet, may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, Asihatu wal faragu neimotan. That is, a good earth, and you having a time to look after yourself. It means you've been blessed with two types of blessings because earth is a blessing and have time to look after yourself is another blessing. Most people have time, but they don't have time to look after their earth. So, and he said again, the cool leader in Dawa on Pata Dawahu illa al haram. Every sickness has a cure. No matter what sickness it is, it has a cure except only one sickness, which is death, only death that has no cure. So as a Muslim and as an imam, I've came across a lot of people, especially with my job as a hospital chaplain. Sometimes they will come around and they will say, imam, just pray for me. I don't want to take my medication. I say, come on, if you don't do that, I will pray for you, but you need to take your medication. Because especially the field where I'm working, mental health, 
I'm looking after about eight hospitals and seeing about 500 service users a month. So you came across a lot of things like experience, which they need to know. So somebody like us in Islam, there's no place for anybody not to be taking their medication. And uh, as Dr. Latley said, there are a lot of problems in our community about culture and uh, issues like that and shame and stigmatization. So people used to hide that they know I'm not, I'm, I'm okay, nothing's happening to me. Even their family will be hiding them. We are asked they need to seek medical uh, support. When you get there, maybe you have been sitting down in your family home or you've been patronizing a pastor or you've been patronizing some people, spiritualists that are taking money to do some rukia in Islam, we call it rukia. They say, no worry, don't go to hospital. You don't need to go to hospital. We will pray for you here. And they'll pay a subitant money to such people. So I always say to them that you don't need all these things. Seek medical support, seek medication. Come to hospital. When you get to hospital, they will treat you. And if there's anything about your faith you want to look into, maybe you are a Christian, maybe you are a Muslim, maybe you are Jewish or Buddhist or Hindus or Sikh, then we call, we signpost you to whoever that can even do better than most of the people outside there. Because to be sincere, all these our mosques and our imams, our pastors, most of them, they just want like advertisement. They want people to be coming to their church. So when they are talking about healing power, healing power, healing power, Jesus will heal you, Muhammad will heal you. They just want their congregation to be more. We are aroused. They're supposed to sign post them to the hospital so that they can seek a proper medical treatment. So I'll stop there for now. In Islam, Islam say you should treat yourself with medication. Then your faith is there and your belief is there because faith is part of the holistic uh, to health. So there's nowhere in Islam, nobody should seek uh, uh, the, the medical treatment. They're supposed to, to look after themselves, themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Now, well, there are four medics here. And one of the things I want to do, or to ask you just briefly, if you can all say, about how you look at the challenge and conflict in your own practice between health and your faith. Um, Dr. Mo, you'd like to start off with that. Are, are there any times where your the way you practice and your beliefs have conflicted in terms of your medical, your medical specialty and your faith and how you've made decisions? You're on mute. Dr. Moore, you're on mute. Thank you. Still catches us out. Yeah, it does. I, I, I was listening, <laughs> you know. <laughs> thank you everyone for having me, yes. Now, uh, thank you for having this. Unfortunately, I missed the, the, the part that was the presentation part because I was, again, with a, a specialist and, uh, and so it causes a bit of problem sometimes. However, you ask a very uh, important question. Now, I don't think there's been a time when there's been a conflict between my faith uh, as a believer and, of course, my profession as a medic. Uh, if anything at all, one probably augments the other. That's, that's what I look at. I can tell you why I say that. I had uh, a 24 year old chap who, when you look at him, you think he's like this Greek God, they call it. He like was- Like the picture of Ayo that he, he showed on the screen, is it? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, Ayo's alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> this guy lived for his gym. He absolutely adored it. And he did everything that was possible he looked like just the Herculean type. And I tell you what, he couldn't stop. It was this insatiable appetite to actually get this body molded to what he wanted. And unfortunately, on one day, he actually lifted so heavy a weight, surpassing whatever is, you know, like a PB, personal best. And he obviously arrested there and then. Luckily for him, there was a passerby who started CPR. And you'd say probably that's what saved him. Now they got him to us and we were there, 24 year old, believe it or not. And obviously he was in VF. He'd been shocked about uh, five times before he came to us. And obviously we started going on with the shocking because he's a young man, we went through all the normally 4H and 40s and things like that. And I tell you what, we shocked him, believe it or not, 
18 times. Yeah, you're looking at Fabrice Mwamba, who actually uh, um, died, as they say, 78 minutes. He was shocked 15 times. This guy, we shocked him, I tell you what, 18 times, and we were all giving up. Just when we decided to call it, we turned around, and then we had the beat. And the next thing you realize, this guy was in sinus rhythm. Yeah? And you're thinking, hang on, what's just happened there? Right. At the same breath, an hour later, there was a little boy who came in who choked on a peanut. And he was lodged in, uh, in his, his larynx. And I tell you what, he came and we managed to get him to cough it up, you know, in terms of, you know, he coughed it up. And of course, guess what happened? He was given the wrong medication. And there and then, he went into anaphylaxis and, of course, sadly died. But what he tells you is that this guy was dead when he was brought in. And after 18 shocks, he's actually alive. And I tell you what, he left the hospital a week later. This lad who came in well, nothing wrong apart from, you know, choking from that and ended up having coughed it, but then given the wrong medication, died thereafter. So for me, it just gives you the understanding that, that look, <laughs> there is a God above there who knows the time. As they say in the Quran, Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'ah. Yeah? Only Allah knows the time when someone's uh, time in this world is up. When it's ready, there's nothing that can stop it. There's not a second that will go beyond it, and there's not a second that would happen before it is right. So for me, that was something of a wake-up call. Even if I was laxing, I was just tripping. I looked at it and said, hang on, this guy... You know, it's the picture of health, but look at it. In doing so, he actually ended up probably creating his downfall. But because the time wasn't right, they actually started CPR and they brought him to us. And indeed, he survived. Now, the lad who was fine, nothing wrong with him. Look at what happened to him. So for me, it is important to remember that when clinicians speak to, to, to people, uh, a patient and other, we need to understand that, look, the cultural problems are there and we need to address them. You know, Britain as it is, is such a, a multicultural society where people have the different beliefs. I remember at, no, at uh, Whitechapel, we conducted an audit and, and what we had then was simple. We found out that people had the understanding that they had to come to hospital, whether it's a headache or a broken nail or a, you know, a runny nose or whatever, they had to come to hospital. And we found out that there was a way we could do it. We ended up that we found out it's a cultural belief. So we handed out leaflets at Whitechapel, you know, um, uh, what do you call it now, the tube station. And in, within a week, the narrative had changed that you need to consult your GP. And it, it, it dropped down by 25%. So sometimes that's what we need to be doing in terms of what. So for me, my faith is augmented by the practice that I have or as a profession that I have. It doesn't conflict with one another. If anything, it helps me believe that. I tell you what, there is a God who is superseding all of us, and he definitely does things for us which we least expect. I'll probably answer the question later when it comes to um, why it is we think that if you've not prayed enough, that's why bad things happen. Far from that. I can give you a simple example. All of the prophets, bar none, I repeat, all of the prophets, bar none, went through their own strife. If you look at Jonah in the belly of the whale, because the belly of the whale, because he disagreed or maybe he disobeyed what he was given in terms of instructions, that was what happened to him. And when he was there 40 days, what happened to him? He did his prayer. He actually turned to his God. He didn't reject it. So he goes to tell you, Jesus, as he said, Isa, Had, Muhammad, he was almost killed but for the intervention of his cousin. So all of them went through their strife. Musa, Moses, all of them. So it doesn't mean because you're prayerful, that means something would not befall you. Forget that. That's out. In fact, it might be your test. So everybody goes to, through strife, goes through tests, and these tests are there to confirm your faith. So in a so, sense, what I will say to summarize what you said is that, in, in fact, as a medic, you feel when a place of privilege because we see people who are, at, you know, touching distance with death and not because of our intervention. It just happens that some people survive and some people don't. So I'm going to put a question to you, Dr. Ayo, now about whether you have, you've ever had any conflict between how you practice and your faith. Does that augment your faith? 
And how do you deal with patients who come to you who say because of aspects of their beliefs, they're not going to submit themselves to treatment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question and we, we get it a lot. I mean, I think from my point of view, my firm belief is healing comes from God. So whether the healing is a miraculous healing because of the power of God, because of prayer or, or because of God's prerogative, or because God, God has given scientists and medical professionals the knowledge and ability to be able to help. I believe healing comes from God. So I, in that respect, I'd, I'd never really had any sort of conflict. I mean, in medical school, there's a thing about evolution and creation and stuff, but I, again, I believe in creation. I don't believe in evolution and origin of species doesn't come into play in my day-to-day -day work, you know? So I, I don't have a problem with it in terms of people who I mean it's so the concept of dying to self is a Christian concept if you really dig into it so being a situation where as, as a doctor I it's, I'm not there to 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 be talking to you about what I believe personally but to be giving you the evidence of what is is it, what you should be what you should be doing to help you <clears throat> have better health so I've never really, other than people maybe say who have, who are Jehovah's Witness, um, who don't believe in blood transfusions and um, um, as a consequence of coming with severe anemia, our treatment options are very limited. I haven't really had any personal cases myself where I think somebody's faith has been a reason um, to um, have a conversation about, okay, picking it apart. Um, but I do think that, <clears throat> I am aware of certain conversations where I've I've talked to people about and they, and what they're saying they think it's a faith thing but it's not a faith thing it's a culture thing like the God forbid that sort of thing that's not to do with your faith that is just in your culture we don't we don't address these kinds of issues that's my personal take on it. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Dr. Joe. When I was presenting, he said that there were aspects of his health that when he told people about he felt were maybe associated with stigma. Um, now, have you, have you come across that? And why do you think that bad health amongst black people is stigmatized and not just seen as, you know, part of the journey? Uh, thanks, Ngozi. Again, that's a, for me, that's a very complex question because the thing with a lot of us Africans and Caribbeans generally is that what we don't understand, we tend to over spiritualize. So because we don't have an understanding of these illnesses, we assign demons and devils, mother-in-laws, neighbors, the neighbor's cat, the neighbor's dog, the neighbor's parrot is the one that's causing it. No, seriously, I've I've seen, I've have I've been a doctor 21 years. I've practiced in Nigeria. We went on missionary trips to Niger. I've, I've you know, done some work in America. Um, black people everywhere tend to be over. We were over the top with spirituality. So when something goes wrong with our physical bodies, we automatically think that there must be some demon somewhere that's causing it. And then in addition to that, from a very strictly Christian Pentecostal perspective, the, there's, there's this thing where you're not seen to be spiritual if, if everything is not okay with you. Um, and like somebody pointed out in the chat group, a lot of times, unfortunately, I want to call them my colleagues, my friends, a lot of pastors, uh, they make a lot of boast about the fact that they've never been to hospital. Um, or they, they don't take any medication. Um, somebody's pointed out the fact that I said mother-in-law. And mother-in-laws get blamed for a lot of things. Um, but, and, and I'm saying this with all humility and sincerity, I have been privileged to treat a lot of pastors. Some of these pastors who preach a lot of faith stuff are my patients. I have had to make them to take medication. We nearly lost a very popular bishop. If you're a Christian, you would, if I mention him, you would know his name. He's Nigerian. He nearly, very nearly died. All right. And I had to say to them, because I, was, I happened to be close to the family, they're not just church members to me. I served under his ministry many years ago. We became very close. I had, the wife called me and I said, look, get the man to take some medication. So this is why I'm saying that we need to get away from this 
um, um, erroneous teaching that you know if if something is wrong with your health, if there's a demon causing it, or you're not spiritual enough, or the, I believe in faith. And God will always deal with us according to the level of our faith. I, I like what Aya said, and I think somebody else has mentioned it. Whether you're taking medication or you're being prayed for, God is the one who ultimately heals. God is the ultimate healer of everything. Medics, we can care for you. We can do a prescription. But at the end of the day, God is sovereign and everything still hands, still hands in the hands of God. So from my perspective, you know, it's really important that Dave, that's, proper balance. The stigma is there because we overinflate things, we over spiritualize things, and then we we want to show everybody that everything is okay with us as a display of our faith, whereas that's not exactly what the Bible says we should be doing. I want to ask Ayo to address the issue of leadership in the church, but just before I do that, it did strike me that I had um I had I came across a patient who had a problem, but they were that the, her husband was a, a pastor and when we talked about some of the solutions she said we can't we can't do that because my husband's in leadership we cannot have that solution and if it's known that we've required treatment it will go down really badly how do I lead my flock so I'm going to ask you first of all I ought to talk about leadership and then I'll ask um Olashe, I need to talk about from a Muslim perspective because I think that this is a really important aspect of our faith and our community and making sure that they access what they should be accessed in a timely manner. Fantastic. So thank you very much. I think, I think it's a great issue. So first of all, I want to say, you know, I'm not leader bashing. Um, mm. And um, my There's some parents... very good leaders out there. Um, Charles, where are you? I want you to say a few things on this, Charles. Um, yeah. Obviously, we've got our own Pastor Joe, we've got Alashini. So obviously Indeed. there are leaders out there. No, but I think it's good because it's no, but could, I, I think the reason it's, it's issue is because obviously, so some of us have grown up with the thing in our mind about not touching the Lord's anointed. That was a very big thing from, you know, um, for me even gr growing up. So coming to the ability to be able to address, to speak truth to power and say as much as this person has been given a position of leadership, that this person is still a human being, you know. Um, so what, I'm, what am I saying? Context, my parents have been pastors. Um, since I think I, since I was 12. Um, so I have grown up in as a pastor's kid in a pastor's house. Uh, I've been um, a, um, a youth pastor, I've been ministry leader, I've been in charge of the worship team. I've, I've been in the space for some time, so I'm not speaking from a place of ignorance. I think the thing we need to understand is that, uh, so sometimes what happens is that we put people in a position that only God should have. So God is the only person who should say something and it be um, absolute and true. And from a cultural point of view, sometimes we raise people and because somebody says something, well, that person is representing God. So therefore, you know, must be, a, 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 they're, they're the same as God. When they're not the same as God, the reality is that everybody is a human being and everybody is fallible. I think, the other thing is that we have to remember that as a leader, as a spiritual leader, not only are you human, but you have gifts in certain areas. So, for instance, one of the big things is, is where we are becoming to the realization of recently is that maybe in the church, we don't have a great grasp on the mental health conversation. Now, a pastor, a leader is supposed to lead his, his flock in spiritual things. But that doesn't mean that that person is necessarily the best person who has the who is equipped and experienced to necessarily address these issues. And just like and Dr. Joe says, what we don't understand, you know, we spiritualize. So yes, it's a demon. And, and, and sometimes, it's, sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's this person has they're struggling with their mental illness. And in the same way that if you had, we're getting to the point where, okay, fine. So you've got high blood pressure, um, take medication. We're not necessarily at the same space when it comes to mental health. Stigma is much of a big issue with mental health. So I think that a certain amount of humility 
needs to come under the leadership. So again, as a consultant acute physician, if I see somebody in hospital and I am not the best person to deal with the problem, what I have to do is refer on and say, your problem is best dealt with by this person. So as pastors and leaders, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, am I, as I represent God in this person's life, am I the most appropriate person to deal with this issue? I think another thing as well, I mean, with regards to leaders being in a situation where, you know, I never, I've never been sick, all that kind of stuff. I mean, <laughs> to me, again, it's false advertising. I, I, I don't think it is something that is useful and beneficial because what you do is as soon as somebody else has a problem, then they now start to think that they're doing something wrong rather than just going through the normal ups and downs in life. Secondly, I think sometimes from a leadership point of view, people have a personal conviction about something and from the pulpit say that as thus says the Lord. So if I personally have a personal conviction about the fact that, okay, so I don't go to parties on a Saturday so as to make sure that I can be awake and ready for Sunday, that might be a personal conviction, but is it the right thing for me to do from the pulpit to say, okay, church, don't go to parties on Saturday? That's the question I think we need. And sometimes as a leader, the thing that we are personally convicted about is the thing that we are saying. Um, and, I, and I think the reality is that we've got to realize that everybody's human. So just, do you know that as you were growing up, there came a time when you realize, huh, my parents are human. You know, <laughs> they, 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 have, they, have, they have desires, they have um, wants, they have flaws. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't love them. It doesn't mean that I don't respect them. I just realize that they're human and we have to come to the realization about it because of the fact that when I'm five, when my dad says, I'm gonna buy you a train, I'm thinking, let's go to Piccadilly, you know? <laughs> I'm gonna get a, a real train. So similarly, um, we have to realize that our leaders are doing their best. Most people I don't believe are out to, um, um, deceive people they're doing their best and our job is to pray for them uphold them and give them the space to be human that's, that's what I feel. thank you Aya. so i'm going to do now i'm going to ask doc um Alash, i need to respond to that and then after that i'm going to bring in um ijabla has got his hand up and then lastly i want you all to just think about this because i'm going to ask everybody to respond to this is a statement that um god is my covid vaccine just think about it and then Think of your response. So, Lashani. Yeah, thanks to the response about leaders and the responsibility that leaders have. Yeah, yeah. Thanks to the uh, Dr. Ngozi, because you are doing this. Nobody will know that you're a professional doctor. So, for you asking us all these questions as if you don't know what is going on at the background. So, it's like a challenge to us anyway, which is very good. And Dr. Lato has said a lot of it. You know, one of the things as a leader, in the community, in our faith groups, in our places of worship is that most of us, we are lack of basic awareness about healthcare issues. So we need to equip ourselves with awareness. When we know about certain things, that is when we can talk about it. But if we don't know about this, we don't know more than Bible, or we don't know more than Quran, we are not in a position to talk about mental health issues. We are not in a position to talk about diabetes or hypertension or some other uh, physical issues or some other things that is affecting our community. We can't talk about it. But as a leader, as Dr. Lato is saying, you don't need to know everything. You can sign post. In our church, there should be a day, or in our mosque, a day that we can chat about social issues. People have some problems, but they, they, want, they want pastors, a mom, to just interfere. We realize this problem, we can't solve it alone. It has been going beyond the knowledge of imam or a pastor. They have to refer them to maybe psychologists or psychiatrists, issue of depression, issue of anxiety, which is not mild anymore. It is now a severe one. So all this issue, we don't need to keep it under the umbrella of our mosque or of our church. We need to throw it away to the specialists so that they can assist us in it. 
For example, during this COVID period, there are a lot of mites about the uh, AstraZeneca or Pfizer. It contains pox, it contains uh, alcohol, it contains uh, fetal cells, all these things. They have to bring it to us. Even if we don't know every, everything, we refer back to these uh, knowledgeable people and they have to educate us before we pass it to them. And that is one of the messages that SCAN is doing, which I actually appreciate. Because when people say they don't want to take vaccination because it contains aborted fetal cells, this is not the type of medication we are, uh, fascination we are talking about. In the beginning, the origin of fascination may contain it, but this particular COVID one is not. But if I don't know it, or I don't have somebody that will enlighten me about it, I will just join the bargain of misinformation, and then maybe as an imam or as a pastor, then I will follow the blind way, which is not good for every one of us in the community. So as a leader, we need to be aware of what is going around, have a good education, and we try as much as possible so that we can correct some minds with our facts that we get so that when people are coming to us, we will be able to guide them to the right path. So this is very important in our community and that is how I think it should be because most of us, we know less. We just want to be a pastor. I just want to be a mom. But what are the things behind it? There are a lot of things that behind it. And thankfully, we have a lot of great scholars, medical practitioners within our community these days. Although they are just showing face, we don't know them before. So now they are coming out to readdress issues that affect our community because every community has to look after themselves. So as a black, I do appreciate you guys, the doctors among us and other professionals for coming out and give us this uh, big, great enlightenment. And we in the mosque, we will continue doing our best so that we can guide our people to good health because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best among you is somebody with good health and, uh, and is very healthier. And the weak one, if you are weak, you can't even practice. You can't go to church. You can't go to mosque if you are on the bed 24 hours seven. So it's good for us to look after our health, doing basic things, do exercises, eat well. And again, we need to start advising our youth about drugs. So most of the people we are finding in mental health today, some of them has drug related issues and they are black boys, they are black ladies. So as a leader too, we need to work on these things, not just to deceive their parents. We need not only prayer, they should take medication and they should seek uh, support, proper support so that everything can be well. And any marriages that is breaking down because we are not talking about physical issues now. We need to talk about physical, social and mental as well, so that things can go well, it won't be a double diagnosis. So that is what I have for now. Let's work together and things, our community will be great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank you. So we've got about seven minutes left. So um, just remember, hold the question about, God is my COVID vaccine. And that for me just sums up the attitudes to medicine in general. So you can keep it COVID related or you can just summarize our session in what you want. I'll just ask Ijabla to ask his question. Nice to see you here. Uh, thank, thank you, Ngozi. Um, I'm really sorry, I joined rather late. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I don't know what has been said so far, but I, I, I personally- quite a, lot, quite a lot, so. Quite a lot, okay. Yes. So, yeah, really I'm, ho I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that it's been recorded and I can watch back. It has been. Okay, fantastic. So, I mean, I've had long, 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 long uh, relationship with religion. Um, I stopped believing when a friend that I went to church with died of um, Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, she suffered and she had, you know, prayers by everybody that you can think of, including um, Pastor Kumi back then. Uh, this was when I was in Nigeria. So she died anyway. And then I began to ask questions about, you know, why did this person die? And then I became agnostic and, and you know, I'm where I am at the moment. Um, but you know, I don't think that black people have very good relationship with religion. It's 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 or faith, for instance. We we see the abuses, we see people actually staging fake miracles so they can extort money from from people. This happens across board, and it doesn't matter which denomination you're talking about here. This is exactly what happens. You know, this this 
miracle, miracle cures are all staged. These people are all con men. And I say this with no apologies. It's, it's just what happens. Now, on a personal level, I think it all depends on how you choose to define God. If God is this person that you pray to, that you have to like praise and like you have to beg him, this God is so needy and is so insecure. You have to praise him. You have to, you know, fast. You have to give him money. You have to go, you know, do all of those things. To me, that diminishes who God is. So I've got to the point where at the moment, I'm not saying that God does not exist, okay? But if God does exist, I don't feel that God has made himself known. I don't think that he is somebody that you can, you know, you can understand. I think he's put all the rules. He's probably set up all the, you know, parameters that hold everything in balance, but you cannot know him. So, and the reason I say that is because think about it. Every minute a child dies from malaria and a lot of other illnesses, right? But... Ijabla, you know what I'm going to do? Because you've, you've already raised some really important points. And I think that because time is limited, it's really important that we give the professionals right. and the people of faith here an opportunity to answer. We cannot end like this. Okay? Okay. 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 I'm going to ask you to stop there because yeah. we, we cannot leave what you've said unanswered. We've got okay. pastors. We've got people of great faith. And obviously you're entitled to your own faith and your opinions, but I think the majority of people that have tuned in today have tuned in to see the intersectionality between faith and health. And so we have to end on the opportunity to give people, the to, to give our pastors and our doctors um, some time to address that. So we've got very limited time, but I'm going to first of all go to um, Ayo, and then I'm going to go to Joe, uh, then Dr. Mo, Olasheni, and I'm going to end with Charles. So please keep it really brief, but just answer, um, if you can, some of the issues that he's, he's raised. And okay. thank you for your question. Yeah, thank, thank you very, very much for your question. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, Ijabla, I'm so sorry about your friend. I'm really sorry. Um, in, so two things, in regards to the, the leadership, I think, again, back to, the, back to the leadership bashing. I find it interesting that to, depending on the on the setting there's lots of conversations about oh look at these people look at these faith healers and all that kind of stuff like that whereas what we're doing is concentrating on some negative we've talked about the fact that these leadership people they are human beings so in every group of human beings there are going to be people who are doing good there are going to be people who are doing not good and the fact that they are Christians or church people is just the umbrella that they're under. So for instance, my opinion is that a lot of the issues that I say Boko Haram are doing, it's not a religious thing. It is a socioeconomic motivation. That's my opinion. Don't, don't shoot me. So to, with regards to the um, leadership, for instance, the church, the church as an organization is doing lots of good, but there are parts of the church who are filled with human beings who are making choices that are not good. But why are we concentrating on the church, for instance? So, so, so Kellogg's, you, you, like, you, you like cereal, presumably. Um, you go to Kellogg's, so you think Kellogg's loves me, they want me to be, you know, have vitamin D and I and all this kinds of stuff. I challenge you to get Kellogg's conflicts and walk out of Asda. And then you realize that Kellogg's don't care whether you live or die as long as you pay for those conflicts because that is their business. So the point I'm making is that fine, not, not fine, I'm not rubbish in it. There are people in any group of people or any organization who do bad things, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a representative of the whole group. I'll leave that there. Specifically about God is my COVID vaccine. So I heard recently that one of the things that the devil does is that it wants, the devil wants you to make a fear-based decision that God won't honor because God honors faith. Now, COVID vaccine. I took a long time to take the COVID vaccine because obviously with George Floyd and that kind of stuff, the people who are at the top or, you know, uh, promoting these, some, some of those people don't look like me. And my concern was you are the people who have consistently and historically disenfranchised people that look like me so for you to tell me that it's safe is not reassuring for me because worst case scenario something bad happens you're going to say oh yeah sorry 
Um, and what I had to realize is that that's my fear talking, because why couldn't I believe that God has organized things to give people the knowledge to be able to produce the vaccine um, quickly? So I, could, I think in, it, there's a degree to which it might not even matter what decision you make as long as you make the decision in faith. So I am going to take the COVID vaccine because this, just like Dr. Diazage said, this is a bigger issue than just COVID. Why, why, did, why have we never had a conversation about vaccines ever before? This issue isn't COVID. This is about fear. We are, we are having a conversation about our fear and COVID is a thing that we can talk about right now. So for me, I took the COVID vaccine because of the fact that I don't want to make decisions in my life based on fear because God honors faith. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Joe. Okay, thank you Ngozi. Um, thank you Ijabla for your comments. And I also want to give you my condolences regarding your friend. I would actually like to engage you in a discussion because I take exception to the statement that you made that all faith healers are fake. I totally take exception to that. I disagree with you completely. What I will say is, and I'm going to go very, I'm going to put on my pastoral hat. It's interesting how people, when they get disappointed, they're very quick to blame it on God, forgetting that the Bible itself tells us that it's because of the discrepancies in the world that Jesus had to come in the first place. The Bible says that for this cause, for this reason, the Son of God was made manifest so that he could destroy all the works of the devil. We forget the fact that the world is a bad, bad, bad place. And it's God who is trying to bring some balance and some meaning into the world. That's why we are people of faith in the first place. So your friend died not because God did not heal them. Your friend died because the world is a you know, is, a, is in a fallen state. That's exactly the same reason why God had to send his son into the world to, to, for our sins to come and save us because God himself saw that we were in a bad state and he brought that as a solution to us. Now, if you choose to accept his solution or his way, then you can gain uh, salvation. If you don't choose that, then it's entirely up to you. But I would love to engage you in a, in a personal debate and to, because this is what I do. I have been a Christian for 20, 20, 27, 28 years, and I know what I know, and I've seen what I've seen, and I know that God is able to heal, and I know that God is able to save. So I will, I will just say that, and, you know, because we are really short of time, and I will allow other people to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Dr. Mo. Uh, yeah, um, I'll echo the sentiments of uh, my colleagues. Uh, it's definitely sad, and as I say, there's nothing... Worse, worse than losing a loved one, especially when you think that person is so religious. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you cite the Quran, Surah Rahman, he said, Kullu man alayna faan. It, it means every one of us, including angels, genes, humans, will all pass, including the angel of death. So th there's nobody that will remain on earth. Now, one thing we have to understand is that uh, the development of a, a child in the mother's womb is like, in, in the hadith that we know, is like three stages. The first four weeks are in the state of um, sexual male and female discharge. The next four weeks is in the state of um, like the jamet we know about, you know. And then the next four weeks is obviously is in the state of, you know, flesh, a morsel of flesh. And it's at that point that the angel comes down and breathes the life into that baby and telling them about four things. I'm not going to go into the four things. I'll just tell you one of them, you know, when they will die, that is what they're told. And only that person knows it. You can be the daughter or the mother or the father or anybody with that person, but you will not know that until the time is right when they'll be leaving this world. So there's nobody that is exempt from that. And it's actually from death that Allah created life. It is also from life that you'll be taken back to death and it's from that death that you'll be arisen, if you like, to come up and face your judgment. So it's there, clear in the, script, in the scriptures, whether Christian, Hindu, or, or Jewish, or Islamic, it's there that everybody that is will pass on, including the angel of death. Now, the fact that people think that, uh, what's the word? You say, what's the phrase? Uh, God is my COVID. Well, COVID, obviously, <laughs> God is your COVID. But yeah, I don't know how you can tell me God is your COVID 
when in actual fact, COVID vaccine. All right, COVID vaccine. Yeah, COVID yeah. vaccine. That's right. Yeah, apologies. Now, how can you tell me that when all the other vaccines that we know about are saving, like, for example, the MMR alone is saving more than 2 million lives a year? Now, I, I, I've got this, you know, this program that I've been presenting all the time. We're saving 20 million lives just by vaccines. Just think about that. If we did not have the vaccines, we'd be losing 20 million. And I tell you what, if you think it's a joke, then go back to history and look at 1918, when 55 million people died from 500 million people that contracted uh, this COVID vaccine, a uh, COVID uh, illness as it were. The, the Spanish flu, isn't it? The Spanish flu. And that's so, it. So, so, so the problem we have is we've got to understand that, look, we are blessed to have these vaccines. Because I'll tell you what, and the other thing is, it's just a 2 to 3% mortality. So if you don't take the vaccine and you have the information, that's entirely up to yourself. Nobody will force you to do it. You have to make up your mind. As I say, religion might not be for everybody. And likewise, vaccines might not be for everybody. But you have the blessed opportunity to protect yourselves and your loved ones. And therefore, I tell you, God will not come down and speak to you and tell you the vaccines are good. It's your fellow human beings, the likes of us, that will talk to you. So my advice to you is listen and thank your gods that definitely these vaccines are there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Olashini. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, the last question, God is my prophet fasting, I would say yes. Because if God is not your prophet fasting, it might be Satan or devil. So the wisdom people are using is from God to produce the fasting. So definitely God is your COVID fasting because if not God, they might not have that intelligence to develop that uh, fasting, fasting and it works well. So thank God for giving us that uh, fasting. Then on the issue of a church or mosque, Ijabla, sorry for that anyway. I'm very apologetic to that. It comes and uh, that's how it is. But the area I want you to look into, you say you're in Nigeria. Have you ever been in an hospital where a doctor will ask you to deposit maybe one million or two million? Now, don't worry, your patient will survive. Just deposit the money. And immediately you transfer the money, maybe two million or three million naira, and you they pronounce the person dead. That is not in the church. And you've never stopped going to the hospital since then. So the same thing, all these, our church leader, the mosque leader or temple leader, they might want to, they want to do one or two things. Maybe just the thing turn the other way. So please don't take that as an offense. Continue to live as human being. Since you are not stopping going to the hospital after they ask you to drop 5 million in their account and you drop it and immediately the money line that there's a lot, they find out that the guy is dead. So the same thing might still happen in the hospital. But what I will encourage every one of us is whatever we are going through before it's getting too, too harsh, don't go to religious leader first. Go to hospital, call 999. So from there at hospital, they will ask you if you're a Christian, they will call a Christian chaplain to come and see you. If you're a Muslim, they will call a Muslim chaplain to come and see you. So that is a way forward. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Charles, I'm going to give the last word to you. Uh, just, just before I do that, I wanted to say thank you to everybody that's here today. It's just been a really, really brilliant session. And Charles, um, it would be really nice to hear some words from you. Yeah, th thanks to our panelists and, you know, thanks everyone for coming. I, I noticed a comment in the chat box that we need a whole day for this. But it's been great hearing personal stories. And, you know, uh, yeah, Dr. Joe, thanks for wanting to, uh, you know, engage each other a bit more, you know, and have conversations. And, you know, so condolences once again. I mean, I, I am dealing with a situation, well, preparing for a burial, you know, of a member in my church who sadly passed due to, you know, cancer. And, and I think the point has been made sometimes, you know, I'm a pastor as well. Sometimes we don't have the humility, but we all know that it's only God who has the final say. It's only God who decrees a thing and, you know, nothing changes that. And, and so, yes, there are times where the humility isn't there. But I like the analogy from, you know, Imam Ulashini, just because you go to the hospital and you make your payment after consultation and things don't go well. It doesn't mean that the next time you don't go and, you know, Ngozi will tell you. There are people who have premature babies 
you know, prayers, 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 and some pull through, not all of them pull through. So we've seen testimonies of tumors disappearing, but it doesn't mean all, you know, tumors disappear after prayer. So like, you know, Dr. Ayo shared, you know, there were times when just one person was healed. So, you know, just to say thanks, everyone. The tension isn't necessary. You know, with the God is giving wisdom to our medical professionals. And I like, you know, Dr. Ayo's, you know, honesty about the vaccine and why it took a bit of time. There are so many other times we haven't seen people who look like us in the lead, who, who are challenging the system, or who are fronting campaigns. And that is why for us in Khan, we're delighted to have this opportunity where we bring, you know, Caribbean and African doctors who can share their experiences and be real and tell you what they see on the front line, but also, you know, they can talk about their fate. So many thanks to everyone for coming along. Next week, we're gonna look at dermatology, although Ngozi will be away on holidays. We, we, we will be back here and, and I'm sure she will tune in. But next week is on dermatology. And then on the 17th, as many of you know, there's a drive across the country to get everyone having their first job by the 19th of July, which people have termed Freedom Day. So we're gonna have Dr. You know, Mo Kamara coming back to do something on the vaccines. And then the following week on the 27th, we will be looking at you know uh, maternal, uh, health i mean mental health you know during the pandemic and and finally you know finish of the month of july with kidney related stuff but this has been recorded it's on the Khan youtube channel watch it share with others and let's look after ourselves you know and hopefully as a community we'll be more healthier so thanks everyone have a wonderful weekend and if you haven't had your jab yet god is your vaccine so go grab it Thank you.